Welcome back for part three, the last part of our discussion on sickle cell anemia. Here we're going to discuss the labs commonly ordered on patients with sickle cell disease and the treatments available. As far as the labs go, I've listed them here, some of the more common ones that you'll see ordered on patients with sickle cell disease. I've also listed some of the values that you would expect to see, but I want you to focus less on the numbers, more on the labs themselves. So a CBC, or a complete blood count, is one of the more commonly ordered tests that will give you the hemoglobin and hematocrit. We're pretty familiar with hemoglobin at this point. Hematocrit is the percentage of blood that is red blood cells. So you can see how it would be important to track these things in somebody that has a lot of red blood cell destruction going on. And of course, we would expect the hemoglobin and hematocrit to be low in these patients. Unconjugated bilirubin we're also familiar with, where hemoglobin is broken down in the spleen into unconjugated bilirubin, and ultimately it builds up. So we're going to expect this to be high. The reticulocyte count. We've alluded to this earlier. That's a measure of how the bone marrow is responding to the red blood cell destruction. Remember, reticulocytosis is that process of making new red blood cells to compensate for all the ones being destroyed. So we're going to expect this to be high. Now, an important point, though, is in someone with aplastic crisis, again, that's where the parvovirus B19 infects the erythroid progenitor cells that are trying to make new red blood cells their reticulocyte count is going to be abnormally low because the progenitor cells are unable to compensate for the anemia. So whereas we normally expect it to be high, in them it's abnormally low. Also, lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, is something that is released from uh, sickled cells along with hemoglobin. This is a very nonspecific marker. It's just one marker of hemolysis, but it's also elevated in many other conditions. But it can be useful in gauging how much hemolysis is going on. So we would expect that to be high if that were the case. Haptoglobin we've mentioned. Again, when a sickled red blood cell is lysed intravascularly, it releases hemoglobin. And conveniently waiting nearby is that protein haptoglobin to complex with it and take it away to be removed. So we would expect haptoglobin to be low because it's being used up to bind up all that free hemoglobin. On a peripheral blood smear, we're, of course, going to expect to see sickled red blood cells and also what are known as Howell Jolly bodies. That's what's known, that, um, that's what we refer to these um, little blue clumps on a peripheral blood smear. That's what's going to show up. And what's happening is red blood cells normally have their nucleus taken out before they are fully matured. But sometimes DNA gets left over in the red blood cell, and that's known as a Howell Jolly body. Normally, the spleen removes these red blood cells with these DNA remnants. But in somebody with sickle cell anemia, we know now that their spleens can become non-functional. And so you might see these Howell Jolly bodies floating around because they haven't been removed. Also, we would expect uh, folate and iron to be low because iron is used to make heme for all those new red blood cells. And folic acid is used in DNA synthesis also to make new red blood cells. So unless those things are being properly supplemented, they're going to appear low. As far as treatments, we really need to think of this in terms of acute versus chronic versus preventative. So when we're talking about acute, we're mainly talking about those five triggers. Again, hypoxia, dehydration, acidosis, infection, and cold. And what's wonderful about these treatments acutely is that they are very cheap and very safe. So giving somebody oxygen, IV fluids, keeping them warm. They're very effective ways to stop the sickling process. Now, when we talk about things like bicarb and antibiotics, we want to be more careful and judicious with those, really take into account the patient history before giving something like that, because they do have more side effects and are more expensive. Also available to us are transfusions. Now, there are two types, simple and exchange transfusions. Simple transfusions is when we literally give back packed red blood cells. And the cases where we might do this are if somebody is in a plastic crisis, unable to replenish their red blood cells themselves from the bone marrow, or if somebody is just in a chronic state of anemia, just from all that accumulative uh, red blood cell destruction. And the number we generally look for is when the hemoglobin is 7 to 8 is when we look to transfuse patients. This varies from hospital to hospital. It's absolutely not set in stone. But if somebody is getting this low, you at least want to have that discussion. An exchange transfusion, on the other hand, is where blood is actually removed from the patient very slowly and replaced with warm 
um, fresh blood. And the goal here is to remove sickled cells. And this becomes important in disease states where sickled cells are causing a high degree of morbidity and mortality, like stroke, acute chest syndrome, and priaprism. Again, if you'll recall, these are all um, consequences of vasoocclusion, and acute chest syndrome is the most common cause of death. Stroke has very damaging, irreversible effects, and priaprism is a medical emergency. So you want to have that discussion about possibly giving exchange transfusion to these patients with these um, manifestations. I'll come back to pain control in just a second. When we talk about chronic um, treatments, of course we mentioned that iron and folic acid are used to make new red blood cells, so you absolutely want to supplement patients with those, give them the equipment to make those new red blood cells. And we had mentioned hydroxyurea earlier as increasing levels of hemoglobin F. Hemoglobin F, as you'll recall, was that 2-alpha chain, 2-gamma chain hemoglobin found in the first six months of life that has an increased affinity for O2, or oxygen. And that's important because that's going to avoid that deoxy state where the hemoglobin is without oxygen and more prone to sickling. And pain control is a very, very important thing in chronic disease, in chronic management of uh, sickle cell anemia. Usually these patients will be on a long-acting opioid, like morphine. Um, like morphine. And the thing to remember is sometimes this isn't enough because sometimes they'll show up in the hospital despite being on a home regimen of pain control, they'll have pain that is still uncontrolled. And what we do is we ask the patients, what's your home regimen? And usually we'll end up giving IV opioids. And then the goal is obviously to transition them back to their home regimen of PO or oral opioids so that we can discharge them. Now, as far as preventive measures go, again, we're looking at these five triggers, and the easy ways to avoid them is to avoid high altitudes, drink plenty of fluids, wash your hands to avoid infections, and dress warm. That'll go a long way to preventing some of that sickling process. As far as prophylaxis, we know that the spleen is a very vulnerable organ and that it plays a crucial role in fighting encapsulated bacteria. So if we know that it's ultimately going to become non-functional, we can jump the gun here and give them a pneumococcal vaccine and prophylactic penicillin until the age of five if they have loss of splenic function at an early age. And also in children that are at high risk for stroke, we can identify those children and give them scheduled exchange transfusions. Um, we mentioned for strokes, we want to consider that exchange transfusion. Well, if we know who's at high risk early on, we can just schedule those and avoid the devastating effects in children. And that pretty much sums up the treatments and labs that you uh, want to pay attention to in sickle cell anemia. <laughs>